I'm winding up already. Okay, let's uh, start with the visualization. The holy beings in front of us are self surrounded by sentient beings. This is a very good visualization for reminding us that the holy beings are there when we pay attention to them and that the sentient beings are there too and it's totally impossible to escape from them. (laughs) So when your mind is saying, why don't they leave me alone? Then you remember this visualization and why are we doing this visualization like this? Yeah, it's because both the holy beings and the sentient beings are helping us along the path, and both of them are acting as conditions for us to create merit and to gain realizations. So when we think, I'm tired of being around people, what we're actually saying is, uh, I want to deprive myself of the uh, objects with which I can create merit and the people with which I can practice the Dharma and develop my own good qualities. So next time you hear yourself talk, say that, saying that to yourself, you know, Stop and uh, really think about how dependent we are on sentient beings and how much they figure into not only our worldly happiness but our spiritual progress. So think of a situation where you are upset with somebody. Maybe they were criticizing you or they were bossing you around or they were disrespecting you. any number of things. But you're mad. And what's going on in your mind when you're mad? I'm right. They're wrong. They need to stop this disgusting behavior. And then then it's like the anger is crying out to the universe, make them stop it. So have a little conversation with your angry mind. and ask it very gently, what are you getting out of being angry? And then you take the side of the angry mind and answer. It might take you a minute to figure out What am I getting out of being angry? You know, clearly, ego mind's getting something from it. What is it?
So it's interesting to see what that self-centered mind comes up with. Well, when asked, what are you getting out of being angry? And often what you get as an answer is, I'm important. What do I get out of being angry? I am important. I exist and I am important. And I am right. And then you can kind of respond to the self-centered angry mind and agree, yes, you exist. Yes, you're important. Yes, you're right. So what? Then angry self-centered mind is shocked. Yes, I am. I exist. I'm important. I'm right. And somebody says, so what? Well, maybe I should think about that. So what? I exist. I'm important. I'm right. So what's the big deal? Why do I have to make a big deal about that? How does harming somebody else prove that I exist, I'm important, and I'm right? And anyway, I'm trying to be a kind person and generate bodhicitta. So is the way I'm thinking in accord with my own aspirations, how I really want to be? Maybe so what is a really good response? (laughs) Do I want to go around my whole life? I exist. I'm right. important, more important than anybody else. Do I want to go around my whole life thinking like that? Or do I admire the qualities of people like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the Buddha? And do I want to be like them?
Am I willing to give up my anger and self-importance in order to become the kind of person that I want to be? And so with that, generate bodhicitta as our motivation for listening to Shantideva tell us exactly how to go about doing this. We have a whole theatrical show going on inside of our mind, don't we? Okay, so what's in this chapter is really something to think deeply about. And the first time you hear some of these uh, things that Shantideva is proposing, how to look at the situation, uh, very often we go, what in the world is he talking about? This is just a hocus pocus. It's another form of rationalizing. Yeah, I'm just rationalizing so that I don't get angry or I don't look like I'm angry, but now I look good. Okay. Shantideva really doesn't expect anybody to really think like this. I mean, look what he's saying. Okay. So verse 21, when for the Buddha's own sake, the Buddhas that I respect, when they have no regard for even their own bodies, bodies, then why am I the fool so full of self-importance? Why do I not act like a servant towards them? Meaning towards sentient beings. Does he really expect us to act like a servant towards sentient beings? I am not anybody's servant. Yeah, I am not. When they are nice, and they ask me politely, I will consider doing something for them. But I am not their servant. <laughs> Shantideva, do you understand that? <laughs> Buddha, do you understand that? And I go, okay, have it your way. Just remember, you you create the karma, you experience the result. I love that line, you know, it, it came last last week too. Then why am I the fool so full of self importance? That line is, yeah, that's the question to ask us, yeah. Because we are being the fool. 
And the more we act self-important, the more other people look down on us. Don't they? Yeah. That person's so disagreeable. I'm not disagreeable. (laughs) I am important. Then Shantideva says, because of their happiness, meaning sentient beings' happiness, the conquerors, that is the Buddhas, are delighted. However, if they are harmed, if the sentient beings are harmed, the Buddhas are displeased. Hence, by pleasing sentient beings, I shall delight the Buddhas. And by harming them, I shall hurt the Buddhas. Wait a minute. The Buddha's taking the side of my enemy? Yeah. And if if I hurt my enemy, then the Buddha's going to take their side and say, you're harming me too. No, it's when you really think about it, why, why did the Buddha become a Buddha? You know, what was the motivation? Any of the Buddhas, you know, Tara Manju, Sri, His Holiness, whoever it is, you know, why did they become awakened? Why didn't they just go for arhatship? So much easier to become an arhat. Why did they do three countless great eons of merit? Yeah. Instead of just realizing emptiness, follow Shravaka, our solitary realizer vehicle, attain our hardship. So much easier, so much more peaceful. Yeah. Three countless great eons working with these sentient beings. Oh, how did they put up with it? Of course, that doesn't refer to sentient beings like us, you know. I'm sure the Buddha thinks that we're all excellent practitioners and takes great delight in helping us, you know. Especially since they've been trying to lead us to do enlightenment since beginningless time and we keep on pushing their efforts away. Um, Still... Yeah, I mean, the whole reason they, they put themselves out and, and attain Buddhahood is for the benefit of sentient beings. That doesn't mean for my personal benefit, although I like to think it is. But actually, you know, anybody who, gen- who generates bodhicitta has to do it for each and every sentient being. If one of them is left out, even one, then you can't attain Buddhahood. Because bodhicitta has to be for all sentient beings. So if there's anybody we look at and say, "Ah," you know, with contempt, with disgust, with fear, with however we look at them, you know, pushing them away, yeah, we are preventing ourselves from generating bodhicitta and attaining Buddhahood. And we're also saying to the Buddha, you know, why did you know, why did you do this? And the alternative, if Buddha didn't generate bodhicitta and become enlightened, where would we be? Yeah. If nobody followed the the bodhisattva path, where would we be? What would our lives be like? We'd be in big trouble. Okay. So we've got to think about this. When sentient beings are happy, the Buddhas are delighted. When we, uh, when we cause them happiness, the Buddhists are very delighted. 
when we harm others, the Buddhas are unhappy. So it's important. Really think about this. Go over it in your meditation so that next time you're getting mad at somebody, this pops in your mind. Yeah? Okay. I mean, that's the whole secret to to using all of these things in the chapter is to familiarize our mind with that them in our meditation. Okay? So whatever ability I have to talk about this is due to Sam's kindness. Actually, it wasn't only Sam. There were several others there. And then there were many others since then. Yeah, the credit doesn't go 100% to Sam. There were many others, yeah, who made me rush back to read chapter 6. <laughs> yeah. So, if I know anything about it, it's really due to their kindness, not anything for myself. So I can give you a whole list of all the people who were mean and nasty to me, who we should all appreciate for helping me learn this. This one, this one, that one. And did I tell you this one did? (sighs) But they're all really our benefactors, the people who help us. Hence, by pleasing them, I shall delight the conquerors, and by harming them, I shall hurt the conquerors. Then 123, just as desirable sense objects would give my mind no pleasure if my body was ablaze with fire. Okay, so get that visualization. Your body is ablaze with fire. You're in a house that's on fire. You're in a war zone. And you got bombed. Your body is on fire. And somebody offers you the most delicious chocolate. Does that chocolate give you any pleasure at that moment? No. So likewise... When living creatures are in pain, there is no way for the compassionate ones, that is the Buddhas, to be pleased. Okay, so just as chocolate, even a hot fudge sundae with no calories. Yeah, the perfect hot fudge sundae. Organic, (laughs) vegetarian, good for you, no calories. You know, you finally got that kind of hot fudge sundae, but your body is ablaze with fire. You know, who cares about the hot fudge sundae at that point? Okay? And then you think, you know, when living creatures are in pain, especially due to my unruly behavior towards them, then that's like giving somebody whose body is on fire chocolate. You know, we're giving the compassionate ones, the Buddhas, you know, the pain. We're showing him that the beings he cares the most about, even more than themselves, are in pain. You know, the the Buddhas are not going to be pleased about that. Therefore, as I have caused harm to living beings, today I openly declare all my unwholesome acts that have brought displeasure to the compassionate ones. Please bear with me, O Buddhas, for this displeasure I have caused you. 
Okay, so with the first two lines, we are setting down our foolishness and our self-importance. That came a few verses earlier. And admitting that we have caused harm to living beings. And we're not doing it with our usual way of saying it. Yes, I did that, but they started it. Remember that? And that is something we learned as kids, isn't it? Yeah. After we learned it's not fair, which was our, fir- our first speech, Okay, second one was, but they started it. Yeah. And how did your parents usually react when you said that? <laughs> exactly. I don't care who started it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in my family, that was usually followed by something else. <laughs> like, if you two don't stop it, I'm going to knock your heads together. <laughs> <laughs> that was the big threat, you know. Going to your room, okay, but knocking our heads together. <laughs> it worked, though. <laughs> you know? We didn't want our heads knocked together. (laughs) Okay. So fully admitting, therefore, as I have caused harm to living beings, today I openly declare all my unwholesome acts. And then that takes us back to what? Chapter 2, right? where we're openly revealing all of our misdeeds, all of our faults, not holding back on any of them, and turning to the three jewels for guidance and for help, taking refuge in them to show us the way to change and to purify uh, these seeds of negativities that we've planted in our own mind. Okay, so at this point, we should go back and actually revisit chapter 2. I'll I'll leave that for the moment. But chapter 2 is always good to, to go through. I mean, all these chapters are. And especially when you're doing retreat and you think, I've purified everything already. You know, everything I could remember I did in my life, and none of it was that bad. And anyway, they started it. (laughs) You know, I've purified all those things. There's nothing more that I can remember, and I don't know what I did in my past life anyway. I'm not even sure I believe in those lifetimes. Uh, You know, so, uh, yeah... Can 10,000 be okay? <laughs> I don't need 100,000, you know. I've been a good person. <laughs> yeah, and this retreat's really getting boring now. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Nothing new to, to confess. Okay. So today I openly declare all my unwholesome acts that have brought displeasure to the compassionate ones. Please bear with me, O Buddhas, for this displeasure I have caused you. Okay, so this brings up the thing of of pleasing the Buddhas. Yeah, and pleasing... Uh, you know, when you practice Tantra, if you're doing the succession guru yoga, they talk about pleasing the guru. Okay? So, I don't know about you, but I had strong resistance to those words. 
pleasing the guru, pleasing the Buddha, you know, because those words, you know, I have to please somebody else, what those words meant to me was they have the power, they set the rules. I don't know what the rules are, but if I don't follow them, I'm going to get punished. Okay, so this whole thing about pleasing the guru, pleasing the Buddha, the, the Buddhas, you know, it's like, oh, this sounds too Judaic Christian, you know? It's not for me. So I really wrestled with that. And, I, you know, those words, I just I came to that. Every, you know, you do the sixth session every day, three times, six times. And it's like you come to those words, um, okay, we skip, <laughs> you know. Everything else is fine, but those words. And then it's very interesting. You know, I've seen in my life that small things were happen from completely uh, in com- situations that I would never suspect that would clear f- clarify the situation for me. So what happened this one? Okay, so now I get to tell you one of my stories. My stories? Yeah. So I was in Israel in... I don't know what year it was, sometime. And uh, it was Passover. And I had uh, met somebody who lived in the territories, the occupied territories. And uh, he invited me to join the Passover meal with his family. So I said, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we went, there's so many other things that happened on this trip, but I'm just telling you one little bit. If you're good, maybe I'll tell you the rest some other time. Uh, (laughs) So, so we went there and uh, he had, I think, three kids. He had three kids. So um, one of the daughters was... 26. She was the oldest one. And if you are Orthodox, an Orthodox Jewish woman who is 26, you are an old maid. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you should have gotten married a long time ago. Anyway, so I was talking to her and uh, she was talking about her love of God. Yeah. And and then she said, you know, it's like when you really love a a person, a human being, when you really love somebody, you want to do what makes them happy. You want to please them. So that's the way I feel about God. And I thought you know, it's true. When there's somebody I really care about, I want to I wanna do what makes them happy. I want to please them. And I don't feel like there's any threat or authority issues or punishment awaiting me if I don't. It's just a natural thing that comes. You know, if there's, if there's somebody you really care about, you want to make them happy. Yeah? And so that thing, when she said that, it was like, oh, yeah, that's why it says, may I only do what pleases you. You know, the the prayer, the verses are appealing to that side of us that when we really care and respect somebody, wants to make them happy. So all this other stuff that I had been putting on top of it about authority and rules and I don't know the rules and I'm going to get punished, none of that was there in the verses. So I was reacting to something that was completely my own issue. 
totally made up in my mind. It was not in those verses. Yeah. And after that, I could say the verses and there was no problem. Interesting, isn't it? And she had no intention of clarifying for me something that had been a a hindrance in my practice. But just like that, she did it. Okay. So it's kind of like this here. You know, if, you know, Shantideva is not appealing to, to us, saying, you know, you really should be good little boys and good little girls and be nice to the Buddha because he was so nice to you. <laughs> and if you don't and cause him displeasure, you know, he's really powerful and that's not going to be good for you. You're going to get whacked, you know. But that's not what's going on, you know. The, it's appealing to... You know, can we call it an innate wish to repay the kindness? An innate wish to make the people that we care about happy? That is, when we're on good terms with them. Of course, when they do something we don't like, those are the people we want to make the most unhappy. But that's not the, that's again our trip, isn't it? That has nothing to do with the Buddha's teachings. Totally our trip. It's amazing the things that we get upset about and that we have blocks about that are our own creation. Yeah? Because they don't feel like they're our own creation. It feels like it's out there, something big. Totally made up by our mind. And that's why Lama said, you're already hallucinating, dear. We are. Okay. Therefore, as I have caused harm to living beings, today I openly declare all my unwholesome acts that have brought displeasure to the compassionate ones. Please bear with me, O Buddhas, for this displeasure I have caused you. From now on, Okay, so that was the confession. Now we're making a determination to change. From now on, in order to delight the Tathagatas, I shall serve the universe and definitely cease to cause harm. Although many beings may kick and stamp upon my head, even at the risk of dying, May I delight the protectors of the world by not retaliating. Seems impossible. Yeah. But when you really think of the kindness of the Buddhas and you really think, I want to become like that, and you think of the uselessness of our anger. Yeah. Because how, how has our anger ever really helped us? You know, well, you might say, well, it prevented somebody from stumping all over me. But that's from the worldly viewpoint. Yeah, we want to look at things beyond a worldly viewpoint. Anyway, okay, I prevent somebody from stump- stumping all over me right now. But they're not going to like me, so they're going to try and do the same thing later on. So I really haven't solved anything. Okay. So from now on, in order to delight the Tathagatas, and in order to become the kind of person I want to be, yeah, I want to be like the Tathagatas. I don't want to be like Donald Trump. I don't want to be like Putin. Okay? I don't want to send soldiers out to scare people or to start a war. You know, that's not what I want to do in life. 
So if it's not what I want to do and it's not what I want to be, then I should stop doing my own version of it and stop being my own version of it. Yeah. So I shall serve the universe and definitely cease, cease to cause harm. So there's Lama's thing, our mantra you are the servant, or we say to our, our mantra, I am the servant of others, I am the servant of others, I am the servant of others. Although many beings may kick and stamp upon my head, yeah, even at the risk of dying, may I delight the protectors of the world by not retaliating. So somebody kicking and stamping on our head, making it so that we're at the risk of dying, that's pretty severe. Okay. Have you ever had anything that severe happen to you? Yeah? Or you were at the risk of dying because somebody was stomping on your head and beating you? Yeah? So if even in that severe situation, we're saying, you know... I I don't want to to become angry. I want to not retaliate. I want to copy the behavior of the Tathagatas. Okay? So if even in that kind of extreme situation, I don't want to retaliate, then in all the little daily life things that happen, why should I get so bent out of shape? You know, it's saying, I'm going to really get my act together. Isn't it? Yeah. If there's that extreme situation and I'm saying I don't want to retaliate, then, then you imagine that. That means I'm just lying there, and they're kicking and stomping. Well, you know what? If you put me against somebody who's big enough to kick and stomp on my head, I'm going to lose anyway. (laughs) So, instead of getting angry, I might as well turn my mind to my practice at that point. Yeah, because getting angry is only going to harm. I don't want to die with an angry mind. Okay, if there's a way to escape, I will definitely try to escape. Yeah, I'm not a masochist. Yeah, (laughs) if you can escape, if you can stop it, there's some way to stop the harm, you do it. But to retaliate with an angry mind, you know, who does that make me like? Whose behavior am am I imitating if I do that? And who do I want to be like? Okay. Okay. So even at the risk of dying, may I delight the protectors of the world by not retaliating. Now you say, even at the risk of dying, but dying is a big thing. Okay, I don't want to die. I want to prevent dying. Yeah, well, um, if you think you're never going to die, yeah, you can postpone dying, but there's no way to never going to die. And then, uh, you know, one thing that they're in the newspapers they're quoting now that Thich Nhat Hanh used to say was, uh, there's no one who's born and there's no one who dies. Actually, that comes in many verses uh, in the scriptures. You know, there's no one who, born, who is born and there's no one who dies. There's some, uh, some beautiful verses in the um, 
Samadhi Raja Sutra, the King of Concentration Sutra, like this. Yeah. Now imagine somebody's beating on your head and, you know, really like you're not in good shape. And you think, you know, there's, there's actually no birth and no death. And you can take that meaning in two ways, okay? The way it's meant, like in the Samadhi Raja Sutra, is there's no inherently existent person who's born, and there's no inherently existent person that dies. Yeah, when you search for a person that you can find who is being born and who's dying, you cannot find a solid, concrete person. Yeah. And then, even if you look at that from a worldly viewpoint, we've been born and we've died gazillions of times already. You know, it should be old hat by now. Shouldn't it? Yeah. We've died already many times. We've been born already many times. Yeah. So let's stop being so afraid of it and be able to turn our mind to the Dharma when it's happening. Yeah. Because there is no inherently existent person who's being born or who's dying. It's actually rather shocking, you know, when, when you think about it. Because, Wait a minute. No, I'm here. I'm, I am here. You know, what do you mean there's nobody who's dying? I am here. Yeah, who? Who's going to die? Yeah, this means... Yeah, the body's a bunch of organic material. It's going to keep biodegrading. (laughs) Yeah, and our mind is going to take another direction. And that's all. The trick is to remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 26, there is no doubt that those with the nature of compassion regard all these beings the same as themselves. Furthermore, those who see this Buddha nature as the nature of sentient beings also see the Buddhas themselves. Why then do I do not, why then do I not respect sentient beings? Okay, so there's no doubt that those with the nature of compassion, okay, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, regard all these sentient beings just like they regard themselves, yeah, even as more important than themselves. Okay, so if the Buddhas, who are my object of refuge, who are, are my guides on this path, regard other sentient beings as valuable and more valuable than themselves, then, you know, I should try to as well. And in addition, a second reason in this verse is when we look at sentient beings, look and see their their potential to become a fully awakened being. Yeah. And when you see their potential, then you can see their future and you can see them as Buddhas. I think it's like parents. Now, I have no experience being a parent, at least not in this life. But from the people I talked to, when, when we were babies, yeah, you, I mean, you know when you look at, at parents, how they look at their babies. Yeah, it's like... You know, they've never seen anything as beautiful, as wonderful as their own baby. 
I don't care what happens after that, but when they see their babies, when we are helpless infants, that's the way they see us. Okay? Yeah, you're a mama. True or not true? Very true. true. Yeah? You're a mama? True? Are you thin? Do you have kids? No? Anybody else? I don't think anybody else. Marga, do you have kids? No? Okay. You don't have kids. Okay, nobody else. Unless there's people we don't know about. (laughs) Which, good, they're welcome to come. Yeah? (laughs) Yeah, open the happy doors to everybody. So, um... Yeah, so when parents look at their kids, one of my friends was telling me that, that when he held his, his, his child, I can't remember, boy or girl, it, he, he looked at the, at the child and could see the whole future, you know? And like how he wanted the child to grow up to be and everything wonderful that he wanted his child to have. And everything wonderful that he knew that his child could become. I mean, he looked at that baby who was crying and pooping and saw incredible potential. Yeah, he didn't see a crying, pooping baby. He saw amazing potential. Yeah? So that's what this verse is saying. Yeah? So even those who see this Buddha nature as the nature of these sentient beings, yeah, see the amazing potential these beings have, yeah, that they have the potential to become fully awakened beings. And so it's like that parent who can look at the baby and see this wonderful, all these wonderful things their kid is going to do. Yeah. So if we could look at other sentient beings and say, they're all going to become Buddhas. Wow. Look at what they're going to be able to do. First as bodhisattvas, then as Buddhas. In other words, they're not going to always be this person who's, who is looking and acting like what is sitting in front of me. Yeah. At this very moment, you see something bigger. Like the parent sees, you know, in ex- such an expansive view of what their child could be. So if we could look at other sentient beings, even ones that, that you know, we, we don't like or we're afraid of or we tend to have contempt for, for whatever reason, to look and say, but that being is not going to always be who I think they are at this moment. Yeah. They're going to be a Buddha. They're going to be a Bodhisattva. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. I should respect them like that. Hmm? Okay. Pleasing living beings delights the Tathagatas and perfectly accomplishes my own purpose as well. In addition, it dispels the pain and misery of the universe. Therefore, I should always practice it. Okay, so this verse is talking about the benefits of not only having fortitude towards others' misdeeds, but wanting to please them, wanting to encourage them, wanting to do what will help them fulfill their potential. Because this delights the Tathagatas, you know, because they all want these beings to become Buddhas. And it perfectly accomplishes my own purpose as well because then I save myself from creating so much non-virtue, and in fact, I create tons of virtue. And in addition, it dispels the pain and misery of the universe, 
because when I'm doing things that are beneficial to sentient beings and when I'm helping them and when I am repaying their kindness, then it dispels their pain, their misery, and all the and the misery and pain are of all the other people who they would take out their own misery and pain on. Because you know how it is. We harm one person, and you know how is it? it uh, you know, somebody at work yells at you, so you go home and you yell at your spouse, who yells at your kid, who kill, kicks the dog, who bites the neighbor, who, and then it, it goes on and on. So if we stop ourselves from, you know, harming somebody, then that whole ripple effect of everybody else uh, being harmed is going to stop. Yeah. And we, we hardly ever think of the ripple effect of, of, you know, we just think, okay, I just tell somebody else that, you know, I, shut up. <laughs> Plus, you know, I just tell them that, and it stops there. Then they just know who's boss, and they they shut up, and they leave me alone. Okay, they don't dare say that again to me. But do we think of the ripple effects of that? What else happens? Yeah, if you work in an office, if you're in a family, if you're in a monastery, if you're in a factory, yeah, if you're anywhere where there's other people, yeah, when somebody shows anger, does it stop with just the person who they're angry at? Yeah? You ever been in an Indian train where somebody comes in and starts screaming? Have you ever been on an airplane when somebody is furious and starts screaming. Yeah, I've been in both those situations. You know, it's not just the one person they're screaming at. It's like everybody freezes. Yeah. So we should think sometimes of, you know, okay, I may take it out on this person, but then that person will take it out on somebody. Or that person may go complain to somebody else. Yeah. I tell somebody else off. Then that person goes and says, Oh, look what Chidra did. She got... That, you know, gets somebody else revved up. Either they become revved up at me for being nasty to that person, or they become revved up at that person for, you know, again, I have to listen to you complain about somebody else. Yeah. But somebody else gets revved up by it. Yeah. And then those people go out and complain. Yeah. Like, oh, again, so-and-so said this to so-and-so who came to complain at me, and I'm so sick of listening to these people complain. Yeah. And then what does the boss, you know, the boss, like he locks the doors to his corner office and, <laughs> and sits and stews in it, you know. But do we ever think of the repercussions on other people? I don't, know, I don't think about that. But we should. We should think about it. Yeah. Okay. Because in the same way that our bad behavior has repercussions and the ripple effect, our good, our good behavior does too. Okay, in addition, it dispels the pain and misery of the universe. Therefore, I should always practice it. For example, should some of the king's men cause harm to many people, far-sighted ones would not return the harm, even if they were able to do so. Why? Because they see that these men are not alone, but are supported by the might of the king. Okay, so likewise, I should not underestimate weak beings who cause me a little harm because they are supported by the guardians of hell 
and by the compassionate ones. So behaving like the subjects of that fiery king, I should please all sentient beings. Okay, so this is a, quite an interesting verse. So if you think, okay, the king, yeah, authority figure, has an army, you know, can do anything he wants. So some of the king's men come and harm you. Yeah, are you going to return that knowing that they have the force of the king behind them? Yeah. Well, it depends on what country you're in. If the police beat on you in this country, yeah, many people will retaliate. But what happens is, you know, they get arrested and they get beat on some more. But what this verse is saying, you know, if you realize that if you look far ahead to the effects of your actions, yeah, so far-sighted ones would not return the harm, even if they were able to do so. Yeah, so it's not because they're afraid. It's not because they're cowards. It's because they see that retaliating is not going to get them what they want in the situation. It's not going to solve the, the, the um, problem. Yeah, better, you know, okay, kind of deal with the situation with the king's men and then find another way to deal with the problem so that it, it stops in another way rather than retaliating directly to the people that are harming us. Is that making some sense to you? Yeah? Okay. So if that's the situation, how you want to be with the king, likewise, I should not uh, underestimate weak beings who cause me a little harm. Okay? So in our daily life, what people are, you know, the, the things that, you know, we happen to be very fortunate and the things people do to us really are not that bad compared to what other people are experiencing on this planet today. Yeah? So why do, you know, what's the use of me being so angry? You know, maybe there's a way to please the, sub, you know, like the subjects of that fiery king. I should please all sentient beings. Okay, so one time, actually a couple of you were, were there at the, the um, uh, Life as a Western Buddhist Nun. 1996. Okay, so I was co-organizing it with somebody. And she was kind of like the fiery king, you know. Um, she was the person, <laughs> you know, she had been ordained quite a long time. Uh, uh, the person that people said, she's been ordained a long time. Why is she acting like this? And the response was always, you should have known her before she started practicing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was in Thailand and, you know, there was one monk there who was kind of problematic, um, you know, in his speech and his, way, yeah, his behavior. And one of the other monks came and said, you should have known what he was like before he, he ordained, you know. Okay. So that kind of situation. So... Uh, yeah, needless to say, we had some troubles getting along. And uh, and so what I decided to do, I, I, I started thinking about how in when you do sadhanas, you offer a torma. You know, at the end of the sadhana, you offer a torma to the deity and you offer a torma to protectors. Okay? So a, tor a torma, it's just like a, it's like a hot fudge sundae. It's like, you know, some Danish pastry. It's like whatever it is you like, you know. And uh, and you're offering that to the deity. And when you, you know, you offer tormas to, uh, to you know, the bodhisattvas, who, uh, the protectors who are bodhisattvas, to the oathbound protectors, you know, to spirits and things like that. 
Okay? So I thought, gee, you do that in sadhanas, so I'm going to offer her a torma. So, you know, I didn't, you know, make the Tibetan tormas, you know, what they look like, you know, I'm not going to do that. So, um, you know, somebody or somehow I got some chocolate or something. So, you know, every few days I would give her some chocolate or some cookies or, you know, because we sat right next to each other. Yeah. All, the entire program, we sat next to each other. And then in the break times, we had to work together to make the, the whole thing unfold. So I just said, okay, I'm offering Torma to her, you know. And, and, um, and it worked. You know, it didn't transform her personality, but it made me see her in a different way. And she also did react to me. In, in a different way, yeah. So, yeah. So there's some something to that, yeah. So when it says, uh, so I should please all sentient beings. So that's that's the idea, you know. If somebody is really driving you crazy, um, you know, try and be nice to them. Oh, here's another story. Let me see if I can remember it right. Okay. So there was somebody who, um, yeah, they had a neighbor who dented their car. Yeah. But, and they could tell it was that neighbor who dented it because the color of his car, the paint, was now on the, the dent and the scratch on their car. So they knew it was him. He was an older man who played golf, okay? And they were mad because, you know, he would not admit that, that he dented their car. And they were mad. And so they were sitting around talking, you know, a few of them with their Dharma friends. And somebody said, what would Rinpoche do in this circumstance? And... Well, the answer was, Rinpoche would give him a present. (laughs) So they went and they bought golf balls, some nice kind of golf balls. And they went and knocked on his door. And, you know, it took a while before he answered. I think he looked at the the little people. I don't want to talk to these people. I know what they're coming to say to me. But they, you know, they came back another time and they knocked. Anyway, he finally opened the door and they said, um, you know, we would like to give you this present. And they gave him the, the golf balls and he didn't know what to do. You know, he just stood there like, because he knew what he did. <laughs> Yeah, and these people are giving me a present. Yeah. So it it had some effect. I don't know what happened after that. I can't remember if he came and and eventually apologized or not. But at that point, uh, to the people, it what the people who were practitioners, it didn't really matter, you know, because they were just happy giving him that present and. Yeah, and he was so shocked. Okay. So even if such a king were to become angry, oh, well, let's go back. Verse 130 is, you know, that person who's bugging us, they're not only supported by the compassionate ones who we are displeasing by retaliating to the person who is harming us, but also those, those, <laughs> the person who's, you know, disturbing us is supported by the guardians of hell. Because when we harm somebody with an angry motivation, uh, we're, you know, regis- making a reservation in the hell realm for ourselves. Yeah? Yeah, you want a room in the hell realm? He'll tell you how you do it. Just retaliate. You know, or just drive somebody else crazy or just, you know, cause a fight or, you know, shout at somebody or whatever it is. Okay? 
So, yeah, for they are supported by the guardians of hell and, and by all the compassionate ones. So behaving like the subjects of that fiery king, I should please all sentient beings. Even if such a king were to become angry, could he, he cause the pain of hell, which is the fruit I would have to experience by displeasing sentient beings? No, some otherworldly being, yeah, if I do something to harm them, um, they can't cause me the pain of hell. You know, regard whether they're they're the uh, the king or the the king's men who are you know bugging me. Still, none of them can cause me the the pain of hell. Yeah, none of them. Yeah, which and that is the fruit I would have to experience by displeasing them, sentient beings. And even if such a king were to be kind. He could not possibly grant me Buddhahood, which is the fruit I would obtain by pleasing sentient beings. So actually, that king doesn't have a lot of power. Okay? So, why should I harm sentient beings? Why should, you know, or, yeah. Well, why should I harm sentient beings? Because they're, they can't cause me the pain of, of the guardians of hell. Yeah. Then you might say, well, even if the king were to, be, uh, were to be kind, he could not possibly grant me Buddhahood. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's true, the Buddha cannot grant us Buddhahood. You know, it's something we have to create the causes for. Yeah, but how do I create the causes? Well, Buddhahood is the fruit I would obtain by pleasing sentient beings. So that's how I create the causes for it. Okay, let's stop here. We only have two more verses. It feels like we should go through it again, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you want to go through the this chapter again? Yeah. Maybe we should do a little bit of review on on uh, chapter two about purification. I mean, there's so much in this chapter, isn't there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> who, who doesn't want to, to do this chapter again? Two people. Okay, then you can meditate on it for the rest of the retreat. <laughs> yeah? It's good to hear it again. The next chapter is joyous effort. So if you don't want to do fortitude again... Then you have to practice joyous effort instead. <laughs> okay, questions or comments? Um, early on when, we, when you started, um, I was thinking about um, people that I have been with that were dying that um, had no... Um, no spiritual practice at all. And of all the people mm -hmm. that I watched die, they're the ones that had such misery. It was yeah. so horrible. And it was so hard to reach them uh, also. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that was just very striking. And every case like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, someone's asking us a multi-part question. Okay. Um, so if I don't retaliate because I rely on faith in the idea of pleasing the Buddhas and don't want to hold on to an angry mind but get killed or harmed, how does that benefit the aggressors or my loved ones? For example, if those who love me see that I don't protect myself or them from harm, 
isn't it then harmful on my part to tolerate the harm to my body or life in the current manifestation? That is, if we regard ourselves as benefactors of others, do we not have a duty to protect our own life for their sake in this life, even the enemy to protect them from bad karma of killing? Mm. Okay. So, yeah, from a worldly viewpoint, it makes sense, you know. If you're the one who's uh, in charge of the family, then and you're the powerful one, then, yes, I should protect the family. I should protect other people so that they don't get harmed. And if I let myself get harmed, then they have no protector. Okay? So that's one way of looking at it. Another way is, okay, if I want to teach my children... Uh, fortitude, and I want to teach my children nonviolence because I think fortitude and nonviolence are much more helpful than anger and retaliation. Then, even if, if somebody is beating on me, you know, I can show my children the example of not returning hatred with hatred of not returning violence with violence, of not returning insult with insult. You know, these are the four very, the ascetic practices, remember? You know? So I can show that example to my children. And in the end, that might fortify them more. Because even if I fight back, yeah, I may still wind up in the hospital in a mess, and that wouldn't necessarily even protect them in this life. I mean, we look, we look at certain people. You, you look at, at Gandhi, yeah, and he was quite aware. And look at Martin Luther King, you know. They were all aware that by doing what they were doing non-violently, with not, without anger, they knew that people wanted to kill them for that. But they did it anyway, you know? They stood up. So this is the point. Being, not retaliating, not responding with anger doesn't mean you cave in and do nothing. Like both of them stood up. But they did it without anger. They did it without hatred. They did it at, without causing physical harm. Okay. Who do we, mem we remember? Yeah. Do you remember them? Do you remember the name of the person who killed Gandhi? Do you remember the name of the person who killed King? We don't even remember the, the names of these people. Yeah. We don't even remember the people that hated them. But these kind of leaders, we remember. And they are incredible examples for us. Especially now. Yeah, with what's happening in the world. To have people like that? Yeah. The world needs examples like that. You know, so in a family, too, you know, what kind of example do you want to, to set for your kids? I also have to think that by re retaliating to someone who's furious and harming us, in a way, gives them justification to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. To be able to stand in that place of fortitude and compassion strongly, there's no way that they can't sort of look and go, I'm not getting any there's no justification coming from that side. It becomes more apparent to that mind that you own this, that, you know, there's something about not giving yeah. them another excuse yet to hate you, mm -hmm. is that without the retaliation, they're standing alone in their own negativity. There's, yeah, <laughs> it's yours. Yeah. Which is what I, the, the whole civil rights movement, the beatings that they took on those bridges. <sighs> without retaliating, yeah. made the police look beyond, beyond pale on how horrifying their behavior was. Yep. And that was what got the what got civil the rights 
act past, yeah. So, okay, let's dedicate.